Good afternoon and welcome to this book at lunchtime event on Porcelain, Poem on the Downfall of My City by Doris Grünbein, translated by Karen Leder. My name is Professor Wes Williams. I'm the director here at Torch and I'll be chairing today's session. It's a great pleasure to be here to introduce this Book at Lunchtime event. Book at Lunchtime is, as regulars will know, Torch's flagship event series, taking the form of fortnightly bite-sized book discussions with a range of commentators. In normal times, we'd be offering you sandwiches and the rest. In lockdown times, we're offering you food for thought. Please do take a look at our website and newsletter for the full program for the rest of this term. And indeed, uh, we're already preparing for next term after the summer. I'm going to start today by introducing briefly the four participants in what I'm sure will be a rich, wide ranging and really exciting discussion. First of all, I'm delighted to welcome both the author and the translator to the screen. Doris Grünbein, who hopefully will come on screen in a minute, and Karen Leder. Doris Grünbein was born on the 9th of October 1962 in Dresden. He's one of the most important and internationally renowned German poets and essayists. After the opening of the Iron Curtain, he traveled throughout Europe, Southeast Asia, and the US. He was a guest of the German department at NYU, New York University, and the Villa Aurora in Los Angeles. He's received numerous awards for his work, including the Georg Büchner Prize, the Friedrich Nietzsche Prize, the Friedrich Hölderlin Prize, and the Polish Zbigniew Herbert International Literary Award. His books have been translated into several languages, including, of course, by Karen Leder. He lives in Berlin and Rome. Professor Karen Leder is a professor of modern languages, German at Oxford University and a fellow of New College Oxford. She's published widely on modern German culture and is a prize winning translator and of contemporary German literature. Most recently, the, winning the English Pen Award and an American Pen Heim Award for her translation of Ulrike Almut Sandig. She was a Torch Knowledge Exchange Fellow with the South Bank Center a while ago, and she currently works with MPT, Modern Poetry and Translation, Poet in the City, and the Poetry Society on her continuing project, Mediating Modern, modern Poetry. Welcome to you both, Karen and Doris. Welcome. The next member of our panel today is Professor Patrick Major. I'll wait until Patrick comes on screen. Hello, Patrick. Patrick is a professor of history at the University of Reading, where he's also an associate of the Eastern German Studies Archive. His research interests are primarily the political, social, and cultural history of divided Germany in the Cold War. He's published on the rise and fall of the Berlin Wall and on Hollywood's depictions of quote unquote bad Nazis and quote unquote good Germans. He's currently researching the bombing of Berlin in the Second World War. Finally, and absolutely not last, or in any sense of least, the, mem uh, the member of our panel is Edmund Duval. Hello, Edmund. I'm delighted to welcome you on screen now. Edmund is an artist who writes. Much of his work is about the contingency of memory, bringing particular histories of loss and exile into renewed life. Both his artistic and written practice have broken new ground through their critical engagement with the history and potential of ceramics, as well as with architecture, music, dance, and poetry. Recent sites include the Venetian Ghetto and Ateneo Veneto for his two-part project, Psalm, coinciding with the Venice Biennale in 2019. The latter holds Duval's most ambitious work to date, the Library of Exile, a pavilion of 2,000 books written by those forced to leave their own country or exiled within it. We'll also, I think, be thinking about uh, other aspects of Edmund's work, including the very recent um, Camondo. As you'll see, we've assembled here, uh, to our great privilege, an amazing uh, group of people. Uh, all it uh, needs me to do is just to say a few more words about how we plan to run the next hour or so. We'll begin with a reading from Dus. This will be followed by contextualization of the bombing campaign, amongst other things, from Patrick. Some thoughts then on translation and the reception of uh, Dus's collection in poetry, as well as the work of translation, the craft, uh, from Karen, followed by Edmund's thoughts on poetry, pottery, the work of memory, 
and much else besides. We'll then enter a free for all discussion, uh, including, of course, questions from you, the audience, which I'm hoping you will put in the Q&A function as the discussion today develops. I'll bring those questions into the, into the debate, uh, to the table, as it were, in the last quarter an hour or so of the time we have. All that's left me to do now then is to thank our speakers for coming to this session and to ask you, Dwarfs, uh, to begin with your reading and for others to turn uh, their, um, yeah, you've already got your sound off, I'll turn my camera off, hand over to you, Dwarfs. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me to this session. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and um, I will read some of the poems of this cycle of, of 49 parts. I, I will read seven parts and well let me just say one word. So one, one sentence was always in my mind when I was writing these poems uh, 15, 20 years ago. It was a sentence by Bertolt Brecht, who once said, uh, all our cities are only a part of all the cities which we destroyed. That was uttered in 1944 by Brecht. Alle unsere Städte sind auch nur ein Teil von all den Städten, welche wir zerstörten. In this allergic tone. But... Uh, you can can never forget this this let's, let's say dialectics of war. So and that's when when the idea of that poem uh, started. Porcelain, porcelain. Eins. Wozu klagen, spätgeborene? Lang verschwunden war die Geburtsstadt Freund, als deine Wenigkeit erschien. Feuchte Augen sind was anderes als graues Haar. Wie der Name sagt, du bist zu flink dafür, zu grün. 17 Jahre genügten kaum ein Jugendalter, auszulöschen, was da war. Ein strenges Einheitsgrau schloss die Wunden und von Zauber blieb Verwaltung. Nicht aus Not geschlachtet haben sie ihn, Sachsens Pfau. Flechten wuchsen unverwüstlich über Sandsteinblüten. Elegie, das kehrt wie Schluck auf wieder. Wozu brüten? Fight, fünf. Leise jedes Jahr im Februar trifft von weit her einen Nerv der Lorelei ruf Dresden, Dresden. Stummfilm, nachts im Fernsehen ist sie wieder unversehrt, archiviert die Stadt und kann dich doch nicht trösten. Wochenschau, da gehen sie hin, Passanten, keiner ahnt, was dann geschah, Flaneure, schlanke Damen, Invaliden. Da am Postplatz, sieh nur, Fuhrwerk, Fahrrad, Straßenbahn, eine Kinowelt mit lauter Dietrichs, Buster Kietens. Nur Germania hält am Altmarkt thronend, tonnenschwer, eine Wagner-Diva herrisch sich aus dem Verkehr. Sieben. Ist ein Wunderding, kaum Daumennagel groß, ein Kern, ausgespuckt von einem Kirschendieb, mehr nicht. Hab als Kind ihn lang betrachtet im Museumslicht, unterm Lupenglas ein klein Planet, auratisch fern. Großtat eines Juweliers, ins harte Holz geschnitzt, Augen schreckgeweitet, lauter schreiende Gesichter. Ein Inferno auf der Nadelspitze, Tröpfchen glitzernd. Kaum zu fassen, da in Nutze war verdichtet, was der Stadt bevorstand demnächst. Zum Emblem. Dresden selbst war jener Kirschkern aus dem All gesehen. Achtzehn. Elbtal zwischen Hügeln, siebenbrückig, Traum vertraut. Kannst im Schlaf die Stadt abtasten, was, wie Polyphem, seine Schäfchen in der Höhle. Kennst von Hellerau, bis nach Kotta jedes Grundstück, 
wie sein Sternsystem, heißt geliebt der Astronom. Das Kind im Dresdner Zoo hätte blind den Weg gefunden zu den Pinguinen. Familiäres Glück wirkt fort, heißt's, Unglück ebenso. Schließ die Augen und das Erste, was du siehst, Ruinen. Noch nach 40 Jahren in die Netzhaut eingebrannt. Kennst den Stadtplan wie die Linien deiner Hand. Zwanzig, überhaupt Erinnerung, das kommt aus Hirnregionen und kehrt zurück dahin. Und Herkunft, Heimat sind ein Häuflein Sand in einer Wanderdüne aus Neuronen. Blind von Kind an folgt man, seit sie auf der Rinde eingezeichnet sind, den frühen Wegen, Ortssinn meint. Nicht dort draußen spielt sie die Musik im Schädelinnern. Hier, Memoir en Volontaire, hier geht sie aus und ein. Wie Gedankenlesen ist das, wenn aus Regenrinnen nachts am Tresen Dresden aufersteht, ein ferner Gruß über Zeit und Raum hinweg aus Hypothalamus. Einunddreißig. Spinnweb fein im jüngsten Sonnenlicht, was flirrt, was spiralt da in der lauen Dresdner Luft, Stagnol? Komm, erinnere dich, dem Kind von Mutter angeschirrt, zum Spaziergang war der blaue Himmel übervoll. Zwischen all den Pusteblumen, Luftballons und Drachen sah man etwas Stahlstaub glitzernd fallen. Nicht zu fassen war das, musstest grundlos lachen. Musst es blinzeln wie zur Weihnacht vom Lametta-Glanz, diesem eisigen, was war das, Spritzer von Metall? Waren es Eisenspäne, die da auf der Nase tanzten? 49. Komm ins Zentrum. Und wo liegt das? Unterm Stolperstein, dir zu Füßen, tief im Erdreich. Bleib da, geh nicht weiter. Wo der Staub noch flüstert, dreht sich eine Welt im Kleinen. Falkner sind da, Winzer, Nymphen mit dem Muschelhorn. Oder Putten, froschgesichtig, Schwan- und Seepferdreiter. Schäfergruppen, schöne Gärtnerinnen, Fabeltiere. Porzellan, zerbrechlichstes, wahnsinnig früh verloren, diese heiklen Formen. Worum geht's hier? Einer lauscht was die Töchter Mnemosynes ihm diktieren. Und er tauscht die Zeiten, Räume, Maße, tauscht und tauscht. a lot of historical references in it. So what I wanted to do was actually to go back to the moment really of the end of the war, 1944 to 1945, and try to explain you know, why this happened, but some of the, the politics of afterwards. Um, so could you move to the next slide, please? Um, now, of course, there's a reference in one of the poems to Arthur, you know, Arthur Harris, who is the head of Bomber Command and perhaps the most um, controversial military leader, certainly of the British in World War II, who was charged with this area bombing campaign. And I think we have to remember that the, the RAF had quickly discovered that bombing in daylight led to too many being shot down. So they would bomb at night mm -hmm. and they could only really hit anything as big as a city. But I think we have to be absolutely clear that the targets were the civilian residential 
areas of the cities. Um, this was not collateral damage, to use a phrase from perhaps later on in the 20th century. At the bottom right, you can see one of Arthur Harris's so-called blue books, where he would almost lovingly document the destruction to anything in blue is destruction. And you can see Dresden there. Um, the main weapon of destruction was the incendiary bomb. The theory was that this would create a kind of self-consuming conflagration where cities would destroy themselves. This only worked in terms of creating a firestorm in two cities, Ham Hamburg in July 1943 and Dresden um, at February 1945. But I think it's important to remember that if Arthur Harrison Bomber Command, had, their plans had worked, then every German city would have been experiencing these sorts of levels of destruction. So next slide, please. This was part of what was called Operation Thunderclap. Now, I said that I'm, I'm researching the bombing of Berlin, and it was a revelation to me early on to, to discover that in, originally the main target had been um, the German capital, a plan maybe to try and push Germany out of the war if it would seem to be on the point of collapse anyway. And all the targets which were chosen so at the top right, you can see the, the sort of main circle of destruction. Um, interesting that the ground zero is the Stadtschloss, which has been recently rebuilt. Um, and the plans even considered that there might be something like 200,000 casualties if bomb, bombing of Berlin just went on for, let's say, the best part of a week with the British and the Americans alternating day and night. It's also important that part of Operation Thunderclap did consider other eastern cities, especially if they were undamaged, and that brought Dresden into the frame. But when this plan was first considered, it was then shelved in 1944. Next slide, please. So how did Dresden come to replace Berlin in this plan? Well, the beginning of 1945, we have to remember the context of the where how the war was going. Uh, the Soviets mounted a huge winter offensive, the Vistula Offensive, in the middle of January. It may have got all the way to Berlin, but it really began to peter out at the beginning of February um, on the banks of the order. But before that had happened, British intelligence had raised the possibility that could the West you know, help out the Soviet offensive and the so-called hamper evacuations and reinforcements. A lot of the language which is used is very euphemistic. Churchill himself is key to this decision making for political reasons because he's about to meet Stalin at Yalta. Um, he encourages these plans. And so Operation Thunderclap really gets broken down into smaller pieces. The Americans bomb Berlin very heavily on the 3rd of February, and then both Bomber Command and the Americans bomb Dresden on the 13th and 14th of February in a nighttime so-called double tap raid, where the British have one raid and then another three hours later to try to catch the emergency services out in the open. So it's extremely you know, calculated stuff. This leads, again, because of the concentration of the bombing to a firestorm and 25,000 dead, it's been estimated, uh, killed, including many refugees. So I think you know part of the controversy of this is that this you know would not be allowed under current international law, um, but whether this could be considered a war crime. Um, next slide, please. I think what's interesting is when the Allies become kind of sensitive to this, and one of the big questions for me is why why don't the the British and the Americans, if you like, kind of realize what's going on in their name earlier. But in a press conference immediately after Dresden, um, a reporter, Howard Cowan, files a report in which he uses the phrase um, deliberate terror bombing. 
And then this gets picked up by other newspapers. So that, for instance, the Sunday Times is using this phrase, the weekend after taste, and, and is reporting 250,000 dead, which was interestingly the number that Goebbels had given, where he seems to have inflated it tenfold for propaganda effect. And by the end of March 1945, Churchill himself is beginning to want to distance himself from this and writes a famous memo where he talks about the wanton destruction having to stop and at which Arthur Harris is invited for his view. And you can see at the bottom, this is his typed up section. Interestingly, I think this was added. I think you could almost feel the, the anger in his memorandum because he felt that he was just carrying out really the orders of, of Churchill and the government. But there are references to this memorandum also in the um, in the poems. But he talks about psycho psychologically, um, he would explain it by the connection of German bands and Dresden shepherdesses. The, sh the shepherdesses are the, the mice and porcelain. So that there's like, if you like, it's, it's an emotional response, which the, the, the British media are now um, in, indulging in back for him. I just wanted at the top right, I've put a few examples of porcelain. He also makes the point that um, Dresden was a mass of munition works. I think we also have to remember that lots of enterprises which might have been used for peacetime production in the war were co-opted into this massive war effort, including porcelain. Um, so that Telefunken, which was the one of the kind of electronics companies working in Berlin, used a, a very kind of high grade form of porcelain, which it sprayed onto elements in its radio components. But also porcelain was used to isolate um, electricity, but also at the bottom right, you can see actually just the um, little beads made of porcelain, which were used in the German stick grenades on the end of the string. A final slide, please. Um, I think just to raise some questions about the aftermath of this, um, I mean, I suppose my big question is what, why Dresden as the arch symbol of, of conventional destruction? Hamburg probably experienced more dead in July 1943, about 40,000. I think we shouldn't forget there were also still more um, area bombing raids, which were highly destructive. Fortsheim, 10 days after the Dresden raids in um, Fortsheim was a, quite, a relatively small town. So proportionally, it lost more of its population. Würzburg, but also Potsdam. Potsdam was the final straw, interestingly, for Churchill. And at that point, area bombing officially stopped, but it was literally three weeks before the end of the war. But I think a lot of the poem, of course, talks about memory and talks about the period afterwards. And we have to be aware that this was a site of Cold War contestation, um, that books such as Dresden Eine Kamera klagt an was a a uh, picture volume which came out in East Germany in 1949, which I'm not showing you the, the horrific pictures inside, but there were other books which you know, equated Dresden with, with Hiroshima. But of course also it's the possibility for um, reconciliation. And I'm talking to you from just down the road from Coventry. I used to teach in Coventry for 17 years. Of course, Coventry had its own experience of the war. And the, the famous Coventry Cross of Nails, a copy of which you can see in the, the Frauenkirche at, at Dresden, was used as some sort of bridging function. But clearly, Dresden left a huge question mark over British conduct in the war. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, thank you. And uh, as you said, this is also a site of contestation uh, long after the war. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to Karen to talk about uh, this collection, perhaps more directly, the work of translation and also the reception of the collection um, in contemporary uh, Germany. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Um, I'll be very brief, um, but just to say that I began working on this poem, I was working on a 
uh, an anthology of Doze's poems um, covering 15 years of his work. And interestingly, he asked me to include about 20 of these poems from this selection, which is a considerable, a considerable number. Um, and it intrigued me that it was so central to his conception of his own work um, and gave me a taste to do more. Um, the poem, you've already had a, a taste of it, um, I think, already, um, is a sequence of 49 poems written over a long period between 1995 and 2002. And Doe says that he, he sat down on the anniversary of the bombing each year to write one uh, as a kind of ritual or a game and then brought them together uh, um, at the end. Um, Dresden is his hometown, and that's part of the title, um, The Downfall of My City. So it's an elegy. Uh, a modern elegy um, in many ways, um, but not a conventional elegy, I think it's fair to say, in that you saw right at that first um, uh, strophe, the first poem, um, all kinds of voices take over, the, the green leg, groom by means green leg, the novice writing back um, to a history that he didn't experience, um, literary speeches, uh, uh, many, many literary works, politicians, musicians, myths. Um, foremost among those are, is Paul Celan, the great uh, Jewish poet of the Shoah. And indeed in the title, Porcelain, you can hear Paul Celan, for Celan, um, and many, many other literary quotations come up. So it's a very dense sort of bringing together of voices um, it's also a political poem, uh, as Patrick said, it, it, it and, and Doers introduced it um, as an attempt to reinsert the fate of what might be called a British war crime into the logic of German aggression and to move away from the idea that Dresden was um, an innocent uh, symbol of beauty and culture. Um, that has been, uh, that myth of Dresden as a, as, as, a, as a kind of unique victim has been manipulated and instrumentalized by the right in Germany, um, thereby also taking away the ability of individual Germans to mourn their own losses. Um, so it, it operates at three levels. It seems to me it's very real, the real things that happened. You've got that beautiful poem about the, the tinfoil strips that the Allies dropped as they approached Dresden to confuse the anti-aircraft guns, leaving the city completely vulnerable. Um, but also it's about memory, the business of memory. And finally, um, the business of how to find a language uh, for a modern elegy, a language for such destruction. And it seems to me that it thematizes all those things, it moves on all those levels. There's a key further point, which is about form. It has a very grand title in German, poem. Um, we don't, the normal word for a poem is Gedicht. Um, and it's written in a classical meter, you, you've heard it, um, with strophes, rhymed strophes. Now, right from the beginning, it seemed to me vital to, to translate into that form as well. Um, although rhyme and rhythm are often historical clothing, um, here it seemed to me to be part of the business of trying to write an elegy for something that's gone, but also a disturbed elegy, um, a broken elegy, just like the porcelain at the centre of the poem is, is broken. Um, now, when I started this enterprise, I, my interest was quickened, really, by um, the reception of the poem in German. And I have to say, and I hope Doris doesn't mind me saying, it was a pretty rocky reception when it came out in 2005. And there was four central issues. Critics disputed the right of someone born after the bombing of Dresden to write about it at all. And then they worried about the tone, which they thought was partly too full of pathos, the hometown, but also too cynical, too distant, too fascinated with violence thereby evoking the question again of what kind of language can you use to write about, um, to write about horror, to write about destruction. And then they worried about the form. They really didn't like this idea of the classical form and um, uh, felt, felt it either inappropriate to this vast material or sentimental, even pornographic. It's extraordinary that the number of times the word pornographic comes up. And when I've talked about my translation work in various contexts in Germany or the US or here, it's astonishing how those objections to the poem 
come out again and again and again at a very visceral level. This is obviously a raw and live memory for many, many Germans who object to any way to try and get hold of, hold of it. And so that made me even more determined. Both the reception in Germany, which I thought was just cloth-eared and wrong, but also that ongoing sense that this is too hot to handle um, as a subject. Um, I'd say only two things about my work on this, and I hope it comes up um, in, the, in, in our discussion. Um, first is that I think the critics were wrong about this um, sense of the form. You will have heard already, I think, there are rhythms, but they're broken. There are rhymes, but they're often deliberately missed rhymes or off rhymes. Um, for example, uh, zombies, to rhyme zombies, post for zombies with incendiaries seems to me an interesting um, clash. Words are fatally overdetermined. The word a sprung comes in in one particularly controversial um, poem, which means both a crack, um, a jump between events. Uh, and again, so it boils down questions, constantly questions language. Um, but finally, also porcelain. The poem is full of quotations, as I've said, literary quotation, but also full of art. And at the center is porcelain. Um, Does talks about how he was triggered by a line from a, a Czeslav Milos poem, a song of porcelain, and the sound, that little sound of porcelain being crushed as a symbol of loss. But it also seems to me that if porcelain is the symbolic center of the poem, and the tradition of mice and porcelain in the city, it's also constantly aware of its own inadequacy as a form for holding so much loss. Uh, and part of the, the job of the work as a whole is to constantly test these broken forms and these broken symbols and these inadequate symbols. Um, as I was concluding my work on it, I came across a fantastic display um, uh, uh, at the Palais Japonais in Dresden, which moved to the British Museum, um, partly uh, 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 by Edmund de Waal. And it gave me a way into thinking about this poem, which was, and I know Edmund is going to talk about it now, so I won't say any more, but to think of the poem maybe as a kind of kintsugi, as a joining of the shards, but not echoing wholeness, not bringing things together, but remembering the history and remembering the brokenness. And I tried very hard to do that in my translation. So thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Um, that was wonderful. And it set up Edmund very well, I think in a positive sense, I hope that the word set up um, to bring us to, uh, to, to bring your thoughts um, to the, the final section of this uh, individual um, responses to this collection and to the larger questions of, of memory. Uh, and uh, pottery and poetry that it evokes. So I'll, I'll hand over to you now, Edmund. Thank you. What is this thing of whiteness? Asks Meville in Moby Dick. It's white earth. Porcelain is optima album et pellucidum. It's the whitest and most translucent thing there is in the world. It's come a very long way. Porcelain is fantasy. It begins on the other side of the world. It can only get to Europe through the Silk Road, through unimaginable journeys. But when it arrives in England, it's an object of desire, a material that tells you that you have power, that you are holding something which is both fantastical and mysterious and desirable. It arrives, of course, in Saxony, and desire becomes incarnate with Augustus the Strong sitting in that extraordinary series of palaces in Dresden. He wants porcelain. He has, he says, porcelain Krankenheit, the madness of porcelain. He has hundreds of illegitimate children. He has horses, he has treasures in the green vaults, but most of all, he wants porcelain, white gold. And he captures a young alchemist. He persuades a philosopher at the very start of the 18th century. And this becomes the story of how you Dresden and Meissen and porcelain become intertwined. Dresden becomes a city of alchemists, of walling up science 
in those vaults underneath the city walls. And then finally, in 1708, they open a kiln and out comes the first piece of white earth transformed into porcelain in the West. It's extraordinary. It's a thing of utter beauty. It's so extraordinary that the person who picks it up says it is white and almost as fragrant as a narcissus. And you have to imagine this becomes the beginning of a whole way of thinking about the world through white clay. Augustus builds a palace across the Elbe, the Japanische Palais, where one room of porcelain has to be white, the next yellow, the next purple, all ending up with a, a room of fantasy where he's going to sit on a throne and the whole world will come and kneel in front of him. And there are chapels of porcelain and there are swan services and the whole world is turned into commodities at Meissen, where one thing after another can be made out of this purest of materials. And because it's pure, it's dangerous. Because purity is saying that the world is something you can control. And of course, it's a good German material, which is why in 1936 and 1937, Himmler decides that he wants to have his own porcelain manufacturing too. And it starts on the outskirts of Munich in a little village called Allach, where they start to make porcelain, pure, beautiful German porcelain for the Nazi functionaries. And then because they can, they move the porcelain factory to Dachau. So there is a porcelain manufactory in Dachau with slave labor where visiting dignitaries can choose beautiful white German porcelain. And in 1945, in February, as we've heard, there is the bombing of the city. And on a truck in that city, on that night, there is a whole wagon full of crates which had been looted in 38 from the von Klemperer family, a Jewish family that collected porcelain, that lived with porcelain, dined off porcelain, and had had their collection looted from them. And the collection is mostly destroyed, like everything else in that city. And after the war, as they sift through that wreckage, they find shards and the shards are put away in boxes. And then in 2011, these shards are rediscovered and they're restituted to the von Klemperer family. And they come up for auction and I buy a dinner service in fragments, a broken dinner service of mice and plates that was once on a Jewish family table in Dresden. And then over several years, I ask a friend of mine, an artist called Maiko Tsutsumi to slowly put together with Kintsugi, with golden lacquer, so that we can mark loss, not repair these mycin plates, but actually have this great network of gold lacquer so that you can see where that damage occurred. And then 2019, I open in the Yapanisha Palais a library of exile and on the walls of this library, I brush porcelain slip and I write the names of all the destroyed libraries of the world from Alexandra all the way through, including the looted library of my great grandfather in, 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 in Vienna and the destroyed university libraries. And there it sits surrounding books of exile and nearby I have these stacks of plate. And as I open it, I only then realize that this is not only 250 meters from the first book burning in Germany in 1933, but this is the same room that Victor von Klemperer sat when he was allowed to, until he was barred, and wrote that extraordinary series of scholarly things and diaries in that particular room. So here we have Derz's poem. It is iterative, it is extraordinary, it is full of spaces. I've been reading Celan all my life, uh, and now I read Des Grunbein and I'm moved to tears by what he has done, because I think that what he's done is take us back into a particular moment in Dresden history, one image before I shut up, which is in those extraordinary laboratories where they made porcelain, they had a burning mirror where the light came in and it was forced into such intensity that minerals would be turned into their constituent parts and then they could remake porcelain. 
And I think what Deleuze has done in this incredible and moving translation by Karen Lieder is to give us a burning mirror for Dresden and for poetry. It's hugely moving to be part of this conversation today. I'm gonna to shut up now. Thank you so much. Um, the last thing we want you to do is to shut up. Thank you so much for what you said. I'd also like to bring everybody else back onto screen, uh, please. Um, so many images there, the burning mirror, the kintsugi, the, um, those, yeah, chilling maps that you showed us, Patrick. Um, and of course, so many sounds, including the patterns of, of noise um, that are in Des's original poems and then in Karen's translations. Um, we have a couple of questions, uh, or one uh, question about metrics already from the audience. Um, please, uh, those who are with us, do put more questions into the question and answer uh, function if you'd like to ask more. What I wanted to, to perhaps start things off with is just to pick up on, on it seems to me a number of themes that, that sort of came across um, and there too. One is this relationship between, um, between kind of contested history and the desire nonetheless to make something of it. Um, and uh, Edmund, you talked about not repairing, but marking the loss. Um, and I wondered if, do us to go back to you, if you had any sense of, of repairing something, um, uh, obviously the Kintsugi is, is part of the poem as well, uh, as well as marking loss. So I wondered if we could start with this, this double movement of, of, of repairing, reparation, making amends, but at the same time, marking that which is missing, which is lost. Uh, am I making sense to you here? <laughs> well, I don't think that there can be any relief, of course, but um, there is one element in, in this uh, whole cycle, which brings me and hopefully the reader too, back to childhood, to a, to a childhood uh, realm in a way. Uh, and this is also marked by, by the word or the image of porcelain. Porcelain was uh, also in many, many families uh, through all the different, uh, uh, let's say, shifts of society, uh, a, a very important thing there in Saxonia. I remember my grandmother with not much money, but she had a, a little collection of, of mice and porcelain, which was a very rare thing. So when on Sundays, it was used. And as a child, when I came to her, so I had, I, the cake was served on, 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 on some plates of, of, of mice and porcelain with the, uh, the blue uh, uh, onion uh, ornaments, right? Uh, and in all the families, these, these, Items were, were kept uh, uh, and, and, and handed over to the next generation and so on and so on. And a lot of these things, of course, uh, were damaged uh, at that moment. So, and there was, from the very beginning on, was this link between Dresden, the destruction of Dresden and this material of porcelain. I, 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 I have a, a lot of, uh, a big collection of, of quotes uh, or material collection around this poem. And, and one thing is I found that the BBC News, right on the 16th of February, uh, 1945, that means three days later after the bombing, just said, there is no porcelain in Dresden anymore. So the equation was made very, very early. But then I found that uh, in, in the diaries of Samuel Beckett, he, he, he used to, uh, he, he visited Germany amidst the thirties. That means Nazi Germany. He went to Hamburg, Berlin, also Dresden. Dresden was very important for him. He wanted to see the, 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 the picture gallery. And then in, in his diaries, he refers to the porcelain Madonna, mm -hmm. <laughs> to typical uh, Beckett and so on. So it, it goes through, all the centuries, starting from the moment when, when uh, as Edmund mentioned, uh, August the Strong uh, forced his uh, alchemist Petka, uh, to, to, to make porcelain. Actually, the story behind is that this guy 
came to the court and 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 and, and told the king that he could that he could make gold, which he of course could not. But then he was incarcerated and, and had some time. And then he invented to save his life, so to speak. He invented the porcelain. And August the Strong is, is, is uh, has always said, the desire for porcelain is like the desire for oranges. So you see, I'm amidst a fantastic, uh, a dream in, in, in a fantastic world. And this idea of porcelain uh, seems to connect the ages, connect people, connect collectors. And of course, the, one of the last touching stories is that of the Klemperer edition uh, collection. So I think, um, and this is, or I try to put all these things into this poem. So the poem is actually a kind of a collage, a constellation mm -hmm. uh, of memories, of, of thoughts, feelings, and most of them are collective ones. Thank you, Karen. I wonder if we could uh, pick up on something that you said in your uh, comments on the poem as precisely to pick up on this idea of collecting, because um, Obviously, one of the really striking things about this collection is that it's a collection, <laughs> that it's that it's a, a long poem in one sense, um, but also that, as you said, there are many, many uh, voices, uh, objects, um, other bits of culture, shall we say, inside this poem. Um, so the poem is itself a collection of of various shards, um, elements, um, etc., of history and of, of culture. Um, have you more to say about that? Um, in particular, I guess, about how to transfer or translate some of the energy of that collecting into English? Um, there's two separate questions there. One's about the, the, the sort of form itself, but also the, the mode of trans transforming that collection into English. Um, perhaps it's worth saying, um, because we don't have the book sort of in front of us, that the, the little poems are spaced out in the book, um, sometimes at the bottom of a page, sometimes at the top of a page. And so they feel, thank you, they've, they feel like discrete objects yep. um, with a lot of white around them. I mean, it was wonderful then to come to the white uh, that Edmund was talking about. Yep. Um, and um, so it feels like um, shards, they feel like shards sort of brought together. I love the idea of the burning glass, actually. I think that's an image which we, we should think about. And maybe that the burning glass is in the poetry or in the translation um, uh, here too. Um, I suppose I could focus for a second on the difficulties <laughs> because the different voices are often put together very closely and so that you get a shift of tone from classical pathos to absolute demotic or from a very beautiful image of porcelain to a terrible image of griddled corpses. Um, and that's one of the things that I think caused the offence um, and still causes offence, um, but is also a challenge, I think, for the translator to resist the temptation to smooth it over and make it a whole and make it beautiful, because I think part of it is precisely about the, the um, disparateness of these different things, that the fact that they are a collection of voices and feelings and quotations, but which end up being more than the sum of their parts, which are a, a, a kind of collection. There's an image of, a, of music, there's a lot of music in, in the collection as well. The voices coming together to create a hymn, to create an elegy. Um, and I think it must be something like that. Edmund, you're, yes, go for it. Sorry, I'm just waving because I'm, I, I, I'm so interested in this. I mean, I, of, of course they sit um, as objects, text objects on a page beautifully. There's something, um, uh, they, and they are absolutely intensely polyphonic, you know, um, um, uh, as a series of, of poems ac across the book, which I think is very, very special and extraordinary. Um, um, but what, what I really wanted to say was that um, that surely one of one of the things about this is is that it's 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 iterate, it's iterative. It's about a return each mm -hmm. poem because it has the same form. What I feel Durs is doing is saying you can't contain all of this within a single a single tiny small entity or a single lyric. That it's so so you have that sense of return and return and return. 
And that surely takes you to mourning. I mean, it takes you straight to what Freud understood as mourning and melancholia, which is that you actually, that, that grief is about something which actually has um, no uh, resolution, <laughs> you know, has no lyrical sense of, of, of being able to be put down in any way. And, and that's what I think is at the heart of this extraordinary work is that it is unresolved, <laughs> you know, intentionally unresolved. And, and, and in some ways it's generative, it's fissile. You, you feel almost, I kind of ended it and I thought, well, come on, Des, where's, where's the next poem? Mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and that surely is what makes this uh, uh, so extraordinarily rich uh, for, for, for the reader. So I'm off, I'm muting. No, no, that's that's uh, that's wonderful, and I guess um, before I come to you, Patrick, because I'd like to pick up the notion of repetition um, and and the iterative um, in a different register, really, in a moment, um, in relation to the bombing campaign um, and and the kind of details that you gave us about how the bombing worked. But Dus, um, could you bear to tell us why uh, why you stopped where you did? In other words, Edmund's question: Come on, where's the next poem? Um, is there a reason, uh, is there a sense, is there a logic, a necessity to stopping at the point that you did? You're muted. Um, well, Karen told you already that uh, I had this uh, contract with myself to, to write each year another poem around the, the, the 30th of, of February. Well, and one day I realized that this is, is it enough now? It's it never be enough, but uh, I, had a, I have a lot more of, of, of parts, but I had to arrange them. And when I arranged them, I found out that there will be a number which is good for, for, the, re, for, the, for the purpose, uh, the 49, I don't know why. Sometimes not only me, po poets or uh, uh, novelists are playing a lot with numbers. Just think of Dante. I'm, I'm now translating a little bit of Dante and then there was ah. always this uh, play with, with numbers. So despite there are some more and the material is, is much uh, wider, uh, I, I, I decided to, to, to finish it at that point. So also to... To, and now comes the point also to, to, to bring it to the public and to test it. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, and it started very, uh, from the beginning in, in German receptions, I realized that this will cause a debate and a debate which is still ongoing. So I know it's, it's very controversial being uh, recepted. And, and actually, I must say, it, it makes me proud because I don't like that, that books are just, um, let's say by, by critics are just marked and then thrown away. It's, it's good to have a text, which is, which is a, uh, a, a stepping stone as to speak or whatever you call it. So, um, and, and I'd also like that, that in one of the reviews they picked up uh, uh, one, one of the little pieces. It's, it's, this whole thing is built of elements, of syntactic elements. And one of those mm -hmm. little pieces was dicey forms. And of course, it comes in the last poem. And, and, and of course, these are dicey forms. And we have to discuss about that. What is the diciness of these forms? You already did it. Um, so to come back, I, I just finished it. And, and, and then I, I uh, offered it to the audience as a test. It was a mm -hmm. test. I, and I, I, I really was interested in, in the also historical debates because the, these historical debates or the, the debates on right memory, uh, they are still going on each year. It, mm -hmm. you, can, you can write a book about uh, the changing of the function of memory of the Dresden bombing. Each year there, there is another little anecdote. So uh, I, I was writing a little bit about that. And also why I finished that is that I could go further uh, in other texts to Dresden. So the, this, this city is, is always uh, a main motive in my writing. So I, I wrote some essays then, now I'm working on another book. So, but with this series, I was finished. Well, 
I must add one thing only. Uh, what I found very early, uh, let's say uh, in my youth, it started that there is a somewhat hypocritical point in this debate. And I tried to find out, and I had so many discussions with, with people about that uh, in Germany as well as in England. And I've mostly found, I must say, the, 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 the English partners very, very fair. I, I must say, I can, I can really understand the English point of this thing. Uh, and let me just say this, the main concern at that moment was to finish the war. I don't know if it, it was really appropriate, but it was part of this uh, concept to finish the war. And uh, at any cost, of course. So, well, and for myself, I can say, okay, it's only one of the many stories of World War II, uh, but it's a family story, and that's why mm -hmm. I picked it up. Mm -hmm. The family story, right, in terms of the, the, the family porcelain, all the way through to, the, the, as, as Karen said, the poem of My City is, is a, I would say, enormously strong in this collection. Um, I want to go back to Patrick, uh, though, to, to pick up on to, both on what Duas has just said about the kind of the desire to finish the war um, and the kind of powerfully brutal, really, um, calculation of repetition of the iterative bombing raid that the, the first the Americans and then the British and then the, you know, we need to we need to plan this very carefully, which you brought out so strongly in your presentation. Um, I wonder if you want to say a little bit more about that in, in relation to, to uh, perhaps either, well, I'll, I'll give you an, uh, either in itself, if you like, in the moment, or in relation to this question of when will we be finished with talking about this? When will, we, when will this be not something that we need to return to? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think one thing we should remember is that there were huge disagreements <laughs> within the Air Force leadership about whether this was the right strategy. Um, the Americans on the whole were, were pretty critical of this and didn't want to become involved. But I think it's crucial that we need to remember the Americans were involved in Dresden. They were also involved in Hamburg. So in the, the really destructive raids, this sort of alternating pattern of what they call round the clock bombing made a difference and I think at the time they felt that they just had this surprise Ardennes offensive which they'd had to contain um, the Germans seemed to be devising these new sort of super weapons like jet fighters and so they there was quite a pessimistic feeling in January 1945 when they started reviving Operation Thunderclap and I think my point would be that in terms of helping the Soviet offensive, it had stopped in early February 1945. They knew they weren't you know, trying to break through. Um, I mean, it, when I actually found out when the, the Soviet actually go into Dresden, it's not till at, after the final capitulation. So it's not till I think it's something like the 8th or the 9th of, of May 1945. So there's a lot of politics going on around it, but I wanted to actually come back to the thing that really strikes me about the poems is the sense of place and space and mm -hmm. architecture and buildings and the history is, you know, built in to, to the city. Um, I mean, I first visited Dresden in January 1989, so it was just sort of, you know, an interesting year to visit it. Mm -hmm. And it really struck me about how there were kind of bits of ruins still left and then bits of reconstruction. It felt quite kind of messy in a way, but I grew up in Hull, which was the biggest, the most sort of bomb city in Britain. I'm used to seeing places with missing bits. Um, and I taught in Coventry, where there were also lots of, of missing pieces. But I'm struck by the fact that in Coventry, the cathedral, it was deliberately left as a ruin. And in Berlin, there's the Gedächtniskirche. And I just wonder what, you know, I still feel slightly uncomfortable about the, do we want to call it the Kintsugi of the Frauenkirche? of kind of, you know, re reconstructing it almost as, as a perfect um, replica of itself. But just to add on points of rep reparation and the Cold War, which is where I sort of first came interested, 
Um, in Coventry, the canon of the cathedral, Paul Oestreicher, was one of the big kind of champions of, of reconciliation. And mm -hmm. after long negotiations, got a group of British students to go to Dresden in, I think, 1965 and to you know, actually work on some physical, um, you know, just sort of clear, clearing up rubble and making some sort of atonement. But what was interesting was that the Stasi, were deeply suspicious of what was happening there and always thought that there was kind of something untoward happening. It was being used as a cover for something else. So the, the Cold War always made it very difficult to, to make reparation. Thank you. Um, we've got about five minutes left and that's all I'm afraid. Um, but uh, I would like to just pick up on one of the questions that is there, partly so that we go to the sort of the matter of the poem. So there's a question from Erigo, which has said, I'd like to hear a bit more about metrics from both Dorse and Karen. Uh, this is also something that Edmund drew attention to. Um, is there any regular or more or less regular metrical pattern underlying the collection as a whole? And does this metrical pattern reappear in the English translation? So perhaps we can end, in other words, with the, with the if you like, the gold of the metrics itself in, 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 in within this poetry. Um, I'd like to do this sort of backwards, if I may. In other words, start with Karen first, um, because Karen is a kind of reader, if you like, of the noise of the German and then the, 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 the business of, of, uh, of working that across to the English. Um, and then we'll end with, with those. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think they were wrongly read by German critics quite often who thought of them as absolutely regular. They're not regular. There's an approximation of um, a kind of hexameter. Um, it often has extra beats. So, but, and it, the rhyme isn't entirely regular either. But, but there is this sort of gesture towards grand constructions, a grand architecture, a lost wholeness. Um, but often it plays with that. And one of the challenges of the translation, and obviously the readers can decide whether I've managed it or not, was to try and replicate that in English, which um, that kind of form doesn't sit happily in English. We're used to five beats. We're used to Shakespeare in our heads. Um, so it already feels a little bit odd and unstable in English, a bit dicey maybe, um, which I hope adds to the effect. But yes, very much I wanted to try and get those breaks and lapses and false steps because I think they're part of the poem. Where's your on mute? Which one? Mine? You yeah, sorry. You'd I'm think here. after all this time. Good, good. Joyce, would you like to say anything about the metrics, the, 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 the rhythm? So Karen's made it very clear that there is a, a metrical pattern here, but that, it, that it's a, a broken one, a, a kind of disruptive. Uh, and I mean, I for one think that she's, that was really one of the things I was most amazed by in the reading was, was how well that functioned and how, how limping at various kinds it was and other times you were kind of leaping through. So that, so if, if meter is also a way of walking, it seemed to me that, 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 that the, the sort of the walking mm. patterns in this collection are just extraordinary in the English. Um, uh, how was it for you in the German, Dors? Well, when you say walking, so you relate to the body. And I, I uh, first of all, I always relate to, to what I call the inner ear. So I, I don't actually like to speak only in technical terms about meters uh, because the meter comes uh, very natural to me. So it, it starts with some lines and I know this is a good sound and it has, to, and that's my rule, it had to be very natural. So I don't like so much uh, like uh, literary uh, or, or literary literized uh, uh, forms, uh, which 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 uh, have too much an impulse on the technical side. Of course, there are. I would say it's a, it's a tocheos, whatever, and but it has to be like a natural voice speaking first of all, and then of course, and that's that's this is limiting everything you come to the end of the line and then you have to think about how the line is going on if you if you make a, an enjambment a, a break whatever and well and, and there are so many uh, opportunities to 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 jump 
to the to another line to another Im image uh, but still uh, I had this rule just to stay in, in a sentence like natural like uh, uh, form so what, what you see these are all sentences uh, also the ones who are rather disrupted but these are all sentences so and that gives the whole thing a kind of stability. So again, then is the question, how many lines should one piece have? So, <laughs> well, that also comes natural. I, I, I tried different uh, length forms, right? Um, but then I realized uh, that only this form here could work as a piece of a single memory. So and 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 most of the time when I when I compose things like this, I, I walk around and I had then in mind for some months. So and I uh, rearranged them in mind first. It's really uh, well, this is the, this is the process. <laughs> and, <Thank you. laughs> and of course, it's 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 a hidden dialogue with with other poets. Yes. Yes, no, so that, I mean, that again, both Edmund and uh, Karen talked about the degree to which this is a dialogue with Ceylon, but also with, I mean, from my perspective, it seems to me that there's all sorts of Jubilee and various other poets in here too, whether they're consciously there or not in terms of the architecture of the city and uh, the elegy and so on. Yes, it's it also about the problem of rhyming. There, mm -hmm. In one of the, the pieces there, there is uh, a term which is probably hard to translate, the de-rhymed. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the one who is not rhyming anymore. And there, this is from Ceylan, and he's referring to Osip Mandelstam. Mm -hmm. Because for Osip Mandelstam and, and, and these modern Russian poets, it was still natural to rhyme, as it was for Brodsky, for instance. Mm -hmm. But for Ceylan, it was not anymore. In Ceylan, he was always referring to his mother. His mother taught, taught him German, and, and for, most of all, German poetry by heart. So she was actually quoting all those famous German uh, uh, poetry, and he had it in his mind, and he had really to struggle with that as, as a poet. So, and sometimes he was rhyming still, but then there came the break in, in, in Ceylon's work. And he was thinking constantly about this break. Probably it was the break within the culture. You can't rhyme anymore mm -hmm. <laughs> in, yeah. in the old ways, in the old fashion. Yeah. Um, we said earlier, um, why does this collection have to end where it does? I'm afraid this conversation has to end uh, now. Um, but I would like to end with actually one of the comments, which is in the question and answer session, which is uh, not a question, but huge thanks to all four participants for a fascinating discussion. And perhaps to Urs Grunbein for starting off such an extraordinary series of connections. I don't think I need to say anything else other than to say that I really do hope um, that this will be uh, the first of a number of conversations we might continue to have about porcelain um, and about the work of memory and poetry and history and the way they're all, I mean, desire and power and collecting. So many themes came up today. Um, and uh, I just want to thank all four of you uh, really enormously for, for giving uh, your wisdom, your thoughts, your expertise to this discussion. Um, and uh, to say to our audience, thank you also for being there and for listening. Um, and I'll hold up the book one more time. Make sure you get a copy. Um, yeah. You can see the Kintsugi on the, on the cover as well as the, uh, the, the buildings, the architecture that Patrick was talking about. Um, yeah, this could go on for a very long time. We have to end here. But thank you so much, everybody. Um, uh, and hopefully we can do something like this again in real life, uh, in present, uh, in, in a room somewhere before too long. Um, thank you all. And hopefully we'll see you in a couple of weeks, those who'd like to come back to book at lunchtime. Um, I can't remember what it is in a couple of weeks time, but it's on the website. So um, do look and see. And um, thank you also to the backstage team of uh, Maya and Christina, um, who've put this together uh, with us at Torch. Um, have a good afternoon.